Plant in your mind the seed of a desire that is constructive by making the following your creed and the foundation of your code of ethics. I wish to be of service to my fellow men as I journey through life. To do this, I have adopted this creed as a guide to be followed in dealing with my fellow beings. To train myself so that never, under any circumstances, will I find fault with any person, no matter how much I may disagree with him or how inferior his work may be, as long as I know he is sincerely trying to do his best. To respect my country, my profession, and myself. To be honest and fair with my fellow men, as I expect them to be honest and fair with me. To be a loyal citizen of my country. To speak of it with praise and act always as a worthy custodian of its good name. To be a person whose name carries weight wherever it goes. To base my expectations of reward on a solid foundation of service rendered. To be willing to pay the price of success in honest effort. To look upon my work as an opportunity to be seized with joy and made the most of, and not as a painful drudgery to be reluctantly endured. To remember that success lies within itself, in my own brain. To expect difficulties and to force my way through them. To avoid procrastination in all its forms and never under any circumstances put off until tomorrow any duty that should be performed today. Finally, to take a good trip on the joys of life so I may be courteous to men, faithful to friends, true to God, a fragrance in the path I tread. To do much clear thinking, a man must arrange for regular periods of solitude when he can concentrate and indulge his imagination without distraction. Thomas A. Edison Ask any wise man what he most desires and he will more than likely say, More wisdom. While others may sidetrack your ambitions not a few times, remember that discouragement most frequently comes from within. People like to use their excess energy by chewing the rag. William Wrigley Jr. capitalized this human trait by giving them a stick of spearmint. It is a peculiar trait of human nature, but it is true that the most successful men will work harder for the sake of rendering useful service than they will for money alone. The energy which most people dissipate through lack of self-control would, if organized and used constructively, bring all the necessities and all the luxuries desired. The time which many people devote to gossiping about others would, if controlled and directed constructively, be sufficient to attain the objective of their definite chief aim, if they had such an aim. All successful people grade high on self-control. All failures grade low, generally zero, on this important law of human conduct. Study the comparative analysis chart in the introductory lesson and observe the self-control gradings of Jesse James and Napoleon. Study those around you and observe with profit that all the successful ones exercise self-control, while the failures permit their thoughts, words, and deeds to run wild. One very common and very destructive form of lack of self-control is the habit of talking too much. People of wisdom who know what they want and are bent on getting it guard their conversation carefully. There can be no gain from a volume of uninvited, uncontrolled, loosely spoken words. It is nearly always more profitable to listen than it is to speak. A good listener may, once in a great while, hear something that will add to his stock of knowledge. It requires self-control to become a good listener, but the benefits to be gained are worth the effort. Taking the conversation away from another person is a common form of lack of self-control, which is not only discourteous, but it deprives those who do it of many valuable opportunities to learn from others. After completing this lesson, you should go back to the self-analysis chart in the introductory lesson and regrade yourself on the law of self-control. Perhaps you may wish to reduce your former grading somewhat. Self-control was one of the marked characteristics of all successful leaders whom I have analyzed in gathering material for this course. Luther Burbank said that, in his opinion, self-control was the most important of the fifteen laws of success. During all his years of patient study and observation of the evolutionary processes of vegetable life, he found it necessary to exercise the faculty of self-control despite the fact that he was dealing with inanimate life. John Burroughs, the naturalist, said practically the same thing, that self-control stood near the head of the list in importance of the fifteen laws of success.
The man who exercises complete self-control cannot be permanently defeated, as Emerson has so well stated in his essay on compensation, for the reason that obstacles and opposition have a way of melting away when confronted by the determined mind that is guided to a definite end with complete self-control. Every wealthy man whom I have analyzed, referring to those who have become wealthy through their own efforts, showed such positive evidence that self-control had been one of his strong points that I reached the conclusion that no man can hope to accumulate great wealth and keep it without exercising this necessary quality. The saving of money requires the exercise of self-control of the highest order, as I hope has been made quite clear in the fourth lesson of this course. I am indebted to Edward W. Bach for the following rather colorful description of the extent to which he found it necessary to exercise self-control before he achieved success and was crowned with fame as one of the great journalists of America. Why I believe in poverty as the richest experience that can come to a boy. I make my living trying to edit the Ladies' Home Journal, and because the public has been most generous in its acceptance of that periodical, a share of that success has logically come to me. Hence, a number of my very good readers cherish an opinion that often I have been tempted to correct, a temptation to which I now yield. My correspondents express the conviction variously, but this extract from a letter is a fair sample. It is all very easy for you to preach economy to us when you do not know the necessity for it, to tell us how, as for example in my own case, we must live within my husband's income of eight hundred dollars a year, when you have never known what it is to live on less than thousands. Has it occurred to you, born with the proverbial silver spoon in your mouth, that theoretical writing is pretty cold and futile compared to the actual hand-to-mouth struggle that so many of us live, day by day and year in and year out? An experience that you know not of? An experience that you know not of. Now, how far do the facts square with this statement? Whether or not I was born with the proverbial silver spoon in my mouth, I cannot say. It is true that I was born of well-to-do parents. But when I was six years old, my father lost all his means and faced life at forty-five in a strange country without even necessaries. There are men and their wives who know what that means, for a man to try to come back at forty-five and in a strange country. I had the handicap of not knowing one word of the English language. I went to a public school and learned what I could, and sparse morsels they were. The boys were cruel, as boys are. The teachers were impatient, as tired teachers are. My father could not find his place in the world. My mother, who had always had servants at her beck and call, faced the problems of housekeeping that she had never learned nor been taught, and there was no money. So after school hours my brother and I went home, but not to play. After school hours meant for us to help a mother who daily grew more frail under the burdens that she could not carry. Not for days, but for years, we two boys got up in the gray cold winter dawn when the beds feel so warm to growing boys, and we sifted the coal ashes of the day before's fire for a stray lump or two of unburned coal, and with what we had or could find we made the fire and warmed up the room. Then we set the table for the scant breakfast, went to school, and directly after school we washed the dishes, swept and scrubbed the floors. Living in a three-family tenement, each third week meant that we scrubbed the entire three flights of stairs from the third story to the first, as well as the doorsteps and the sidewalk outside. The latter work was the hardest, for we did it on Saturdays, with the boys of the neighborhood looking on none too kindly. So we did it to the echo of the crack of the ball and bat on the adjoining lot. In the evening, when the other boys could sit by the lamp or study their lessons, we two boys went out with a basket and picked up wood and coal in the adjoining lots, or went after the dozen or so pieces of coal left from the ton of coal put in that afternoon by one of the neighbors, with the spot hungrily fixed in mind by one of us during the day, hoping that the man who carried in the coal might not be too careful in picking up the stray lumps. An experience that you know not of. Don't I? At ten years of age I got my first job, washing the windows of a baker's shop at fifty cents a week. In a week or two I was allowed to sell bread and cakes behind the counter after school hours for a dollar a week, handing out freshly baked cakes and warm, delicious-smelling bread when scarcely a crumb had passed my mouth that day. Then on Saturday mornings I served a route for a weekly paper and sold my remaining stock on the street, 
It meant from sixty to seventy cents for that day's work. I lived in Brooklyn, New York, and the chief means of transportation to Coney Island at that time was the horse car. Near where we lived, the cars would stop to water the horses. The men would jump out and get a drink of water, but the women had no means of quenching their thirst. Seeing the slack, I got a pail, filled it with water and a bit of ice, and with a glass, jumped on each car on Saturday afternoon and all day Sunday, and sold my wares at a cent a glass. And when competition came, as it did very quickly, when other boys saw that a Sunday's work meant two or three dollars, I squeezed a lemon or two in my pail, my liquid became lemonade, and my price two cents a glass, and Sunday meant five dollars to me. Then, in turn, I became a reporter during the evenings, an office boy daytimes, and learned stenography at midnight. My correspondent says she supports her family of husband and child on eight hundred dollars a year, and says I have never known what that means. I supported a family of three on six dollars and twenty-five cents a week, less than one half of her yearly income. When my brother and I combined brought in eight hundred dollars a year, we felt rich. I have, for the first time, gone into these details in print, so that you may know at first hand that the editor of the Ladies' Home Journal is not a theorist when he writes or prints articles that seek to preach economy, or that reflect a hand-to-hand -hand struggle on a small or an invisible income. There is not a single step, not an inch, on the road of direct poverty that I do not know of or have not experienced. And having experienced every thought, every feeling, and every hardship that come to those who travel that road. I say today that I rejoice with every boy who is going through the same experience. Nor am I discounting or forgetting one single pang of the keen hardships that such a struggle means. I would not today exchange my years of the keenest hardship that a boy can know or pass through for any single experience that could have come to me. I know what it means to earn not a dollar, but to earn two cents. I know the value of money as I could have learned it or known it in no other way. I could have been trained for my life work in no surer way. I could not have arrived at a truer understanding of what it means to face a day without a penny in hand, not a loaf of bread in the cupboard, not a piece of kindling wood for the fire, with nothing to eat, and then be a boy with the hunger of nine and ten, with a mother frail and discouraged. An experience that you know not of, don't I? And yet I rejoice in the experience, and I repeat. I envy every boy who is in that condition and going through it. But, and here is the pivot of my strong belief in poverty as an undisguised blessing to a boy. I believe in poverty as a condition to experience, to go through, and then to get out of, not as a condition to stay in. That's all very well. Some will say, easy enough to say, but how can you get out of it? No one can definitely tell another that. No one told me. No two persons can find the same way out. Each must find his way for himself. That depends on the boy. I was determined to get out of poverty because my mother was not born in it, could not stand it, and did not belong in it. This gave me the first essential: a purpose. Then I backed up the purpose with effort and willingness to work and to work at anything that came my way, no matter what it was, so long as it meant the way out. I did not pick and choose. I took what came, and I did it in the best way I knew how. And when I didn't like what I was doing, I still did it well while I was doing it. But I saw to it that I didn't do it any longer than I had to do it. I used every rung in the ladder as a rung to the one above. It meant effort, but out of the effort and the work came the experience, the upbuilding, the development, the capacity to understand and sympathize, the greatest heritage that can come to a boy. And nothing in the world can give that to a boy so that it will burn into him as will poverty. That is why I believe so strongly in poverty, the greatest blessing in the way of the deepest and fullest experience that can come to a boy. But as I repeat, always as a condition to work out of, not to stay in.